Light within my heart, light within my thoughts, light within my words. May one and all and everything, blessed and loved, ever be. Welcome. I am Sister Who. Within every culture and subculture uh, are languages and within those languages foundational ways of connecting ideas and of organizing ideas and relationships. In the present time we have what science calls the periodic table of elements, uh, a numerical sort of way that all the different elements uh, that science has discovered relate to each other and are numerically sequenced and so forth. Uh, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, uh, mercury, every different element uh, that you can name. In times past, uh, especially in Middle Age Europe, they conceived of the reality around them as being composed of five elements, earth, air, water, fire, and spirit and that everything that life included and everything they encountered could be somehow classified under one of those headings. Uh, and that having this basic framework gave them a way of relating to life, in some ways more effective than what we have now, and in certain other ways clearly far less effective. It just, I guess it depends on what you wanted to measure. If what you were wanting to measure was relationships and human experience and subjective qualities, the five elements may be more effective than our periodic table of elements is now. If what you're wanting to measure, on the other hand, is the concrete, observable, factual, objective sort of reality, the periodic table of elements is probably very good because it describes things in terms of how many electrons each atom of this element actually includes. Looking at the five elements, though, there are the added dimension that those brought in almost automatically, that I'm not sure the period, periodic table of elements ever will, is the metaphorical possibilities and the linguistic possibilities. That there are ways in which you could speak of something as being liquid or being water. And it wasn't that it was H2O, hydrogen and oxygen combined to form pure water, it was that it, there was something about it that was liquid, that had some of the properties of water, that it could be transferred and shaped and that it would flow like water, that it was necessary to life like water, um, that there was a way of it, the relationship that we have with water was somehow analogous to the relationship we have with whatever was being compared or classified in that way. Which is why, well, one example, I suppose, would be the subconscious or that dream state, the part of us that exists beyond our conscious knowledge, but it's clearly there because it's always affecting how we speak and do what we do. There's a sense in which all of that is, is mysterious and watery and unformed and, and powerful like the water of a flood, uh, essential like the water to quench one's thirst, and yet mysterious because it may be this shape one moment and that shape another. It may go from water to steam to ice and then back through the whole cycle again or stay in only one of the three forms. Looking at the world around you as uh, the five elements, though, would create all kinds of possibilities of relationship that the periodic table of elements does not. My neo-pagan friends, of course, in uh, orienting their spirituality around nature in a more direct sense, uh, often refer to the five elements, uh, or especially the four elements, because spirit is not always recognized, uh, earth, air, water, and fire, you know, as points of orientation, um, kind of the way sailors in times past would use an instrument called a sextant to chart their course over the ocean when they couldn't see any landforms. They would take out a sextant and measure uh, positions of, 
constellations and positions of stars and figure that if I can see this constellation there and that constellation there, then that means I'm right here on the map. And that's how they navigate their journey. In a similar sort of sense, the five elements can still function like those constellations, helping to chart a spiritual journey. It's not really a literal, concrete, objective sort of thing, but it can nevertheless be extremely empowering. And so very often when my neo-pagan friends are setting up sacred space to do a ritual or an interaction with the divine as they understand the divine to be, it will involve, uh, as they say, casting a circle or defining a circle, either by walking in a circle around a certain space or by placing uh, altars to the five elements around that space with all the altars for spirit in the center, um, altars that uh, address or invoke the masculine and feminine qualities of the divine, uh, understanding, of course, that the divine is probably all of our ideas about masculine and feminine and a whole lot more, that that which is truly God is something more than the current human understanding of what male and female is, or even the current human understanding of what person is, that there is something multidimensional and transcendent and wondrous about God that all of these simple linguistic terms, male, female, God, goddess, father, mother, uh, they're so inadequate to convey the reality that in fact is God. Uh, you know, part of that challenge, of course, is, is that we as human beings are finite and the divine by definition is infinite. And the very notion that the finite could comprehend the infinite uh, as anything more than an intellectual construct uh, is, is really a difficult idea to pursue. To fit the ocean into a single glass of water, for example. Um, nevertheless, we have our glass of water and we drink it to quench our thirst and we do what we can with it. In trying to create a, an inclusive sort of uh, relationship that um, invokes or recognizes or acknowledges these five elements. Uh, you know, and, and how, well, the one point at which I guess uh, one might envy uh, my neo-pagan friends is that because of this uh, spiritual practice of, of casting or creating a circle, they could literally create sacred space anywhere anywhere they go, anywhere at all. There's no limitation whatsoever. Um, there's a sense in which perhaps most spiritual systems regard uh, the divine as omnipresent, that wherever you are could be holy ground. Granting that, there is still an enormous focus within Christianity upon formal structures as sacred spaces, an actual church building, a cathedral, uh, for Jewish people, perhaps the synagogue, though my understanding of the Jewish synagogue is it is more about the membership being gathered than it is about the place where they're gathered. So in that sense, they might be uh, part way on the, on the spectrum of uh, communal gatherings. They might be somewhere between Christianity and neo-paganism. Neo-paganism, of course, looks at uh, the sacred space as being defined by the membership who are there and the intention and the presence and the focus that they bring to that. It's all different ways of relating to the divine though. And But the point of this show uh, was that I wanted to look a little bit more at the metaphors of earth, air, fire, water, and spirit and how anyone could use these to empower their own spiritual path for myself, in I'm always looking for something that uh, builds a bridge between Christian and pagan worlds, uh, because I find elements of each spirituality within me, uh, that, or rather that spirituality that is uniquely mine, has commonalities with both paganism and Christianity. My, my primary uh, statement about being Christian, I guess, is that 
I consider myself a Christian in the sense of one who aspires to be genuinely Christ-like, uh, not in the sense of one who uh, subscribes to the tenets of any particular institution of Christianity. Uh, it has always seemed to me, I suppose, that God had to be more than what any church has ever said God was or is. You know, that the definitions I, with which people have presented me are, are inadequate to the reality of that which is truly God. And the word sounds the same, but in my use of it, I, when I say the word God, I'm in my mind I'm spelling it G-O-D-D-E. That uh, embodiment of perfect love and perfect wisdom that uh, includes but transcends our definitions of maleness and femaleness, of masculine and feminine. Uh, and by going with a spelling of G-O-D-D-E, it places it between the two so that it's not exactly goddess at the exclusion of God, and it's not God at the exclusion of goddess, but it's the, it's the joining and the interweaving of the two so that there can be one and oneness and unity even within uh, perceptions of gender within the divine. In relating to the four elements, though, I, I wanted to come up with a song that I could use at the beginning of a ritual, something that that was compatible with my pagan understandings and equally compatible with my Christian understandings uh, by the things I included in it. And so I, I, it needed to be something simple. It needed to be something that could be done repetitiously if I wanted to stretch it out to more than a 30-second ritual. Uh, and yet it needed to be something that everybody could sing, that I wasn't looking down on anyone, that I wasn't excluding anyone while I was performing this, and that if I did perform this as a ritual and invited other people to attend, they could feel included and they could feel respected by the words that I chose to use, that I was somehow reaching for inclusive language, uh, not because it would have any effect on the divine or my relationship with the divine, but because it would have an effect upon me and my ability to enter into that relationship. And so to empower the ritual, I wanted a song that would be a bridge that would allow me to fully enter into it and to be fully present with uh, whatever God wished to uh, make reveal to me, make, make real to me, uh, say to me, help me to understand whatever interaction happens that I would be fully present and fully attentive for those. So I call it my elemental invocation. Earth as my body Moving through time Telling the story Of life that is mine Guiding my soul to ways far more sublime. Earth as my body moving through time. Water as the flowing that keeps me alive. Unfolding the story each day I survive, giving my dreams the means to rise and thrive. Her water as the flowing that keeps me alive. Air as the space where my spirit takes wing the lyrics and the feelings that move my voice to sing the dance in clouds and rainbows that greatest meaning brings air as the space where my spirit 
takes wing. Fire as the passage from form to free burns all limitation to only liberty. The bridge from this world to the one I cannot see. Fire as the passage from form to free. Spirit as the circle within which all things shine. The dust cloud wind and fire that I can know as mine. The reason for living from here to farthest line. Spirit as the circle within which all things shine. I've heard of a lot of different spiritual paths over the course of my life and a lot of different ways of relating to the divine, a lot of different names for the divine. And I settled on the name God, G-O-D-D-E, as the integration of masculine and feminine and spirit and idea and everything. And I, you know, for so long people kept saying, yes, but what are you? And they wanted me to put myself in some sort of category. Are you Christian? Are you pagan? Are you, well, why can't I be all of them? Well, the term I finally came up with was that I'm an eclectic mystic. I'm someone who focuses on the essence of God more than the form, someone who ponders the questions more than the answers, and consequently doesn't get terribly involved in doctrinal disputes. It's, it's, to me, it's not about debating and finding out who's right or wrong. It's about empowering our spiritual paths and empowering our spiritual relationships. And if we can do that through the use of the five elements, uh, what argument should anyone have to that? The image, I guess, that came to me some time ago was to consider that that which is truly divine pre-existed humanity and consequently pre-existed all of the sacred texts and all of the human descriptions of the divine, none of which have ever been able to fully encompass all that the divine is. Uh, first and foremost because the divine is infinite and we are finite and you cannot contain the infinite within the finite uh, by definition the two are the finite can be within the infinite but the infinite cannot be within the, the finite you can add a glass of water to the ocean and have it and encompassed by the ocean but you cannot fit the ocean into a glass of water that being the case, the, the most remarkable and wonderful thing, I suppose, is that even with this uh, extreme contrast between the infinite and the finite, that within each is still this desire to have a relationship of love with the other. That just as I care for my dogs and would lay my life on the line for them because they are my family, that even though I don't have a particularly good language with them, I'm half a dozen words, I suppose, uh, in a similar sort of way, that which is truly God has often expressed uh, something that we would be, we'd be hard-pressed not to call it love. Manifestations and things that happen that just look and feel so much like love, what other word would suffice? I don't know. And yet, that love happens in spite of the fact that we don't have a particularly well-developed understanding of each other. Uh, you know, the divine may understand everything about us, but we understand so little about the divine. And yet this relationship of love persists in millions of different forms over thousands upon thousands of years uh, by countless numbers of people in diverse cultures and places and lands and languages. 
still the relationship of love persists. The, the hunger for truth persists. In every age and land and people and place, there is always somebody who feels this great hunger for truth. And I, I have to believe that somewhere in that hunger, what the finite is seeking is connection with the infinite. That what the finite is seeking, that what we as, as human beings are seeking is some sort of uh, affirmation or manifestation of this relationship of love that we have with the infinite, with the divine. And so when we come to the five elements, you know, that, that earth is that part of us that is dense and has substance and a lower vibration, and it is part of us. And I, I respectfully disagree with my New Age friends who keep talking about wanting to raise vibrations and evolve and so forth. Well, that's all well and good, but I'm not sure, I'm not convinced at least. Uh, I'm, I mean, I'm sure they have all kinds of arguments to offer me, but I'm not convinced that the more dense part of ourselves uh, do not also have a place within the, the final, more complete, if there is a final, within the more complete picture of the universe and of life and of multidimensional reality. I don't, you know, if ascension means totally immersing ourselves metaphorically in the element of air um, and leaving behind everything that we knew of earth and everything we knew of water, that taking the the earth and the water that form our bodies and submitting to them, them to some kind of transforming fire so that we can become pure air, you know, at which point we leave the other three elements behind and they are no longer part of us. I find that a little peculiar. It, it seems to me that to be holistic, uh, that is to be holy in, in more ways than one, uh, is to retain all of our dimensions, not to ensconce ourselves in only one of them. Any more than living here on Earth, there are people who wish to look in the mirror and see themselves as nothing more than physical. I suppose that would make it more simple in some ways and in, and in some ways more accessible, more manageable. But it seems to me that we would also be seriously impoverishing ourselves by doing that that we, in, in, our, in our wholeness, and one could say in our holiness, we are holistic, integrated, complex, multidimensional beings. There is part of us that is earth, that is form, that is substance. There is part of us that is water. There is that energy and the, the electrical uh, processes arcing back and forth within our brains and within every cell of our body that that is the fire. There is the air that fills our lungs and that gives our voices the ability to be heard. There is the spirit, the consciousness that animates all of those in concert, in harmony, in a, a symbiotic, integrated, um, complementary sort of way. And having all of these together makes a whole person, and yet even making a whole person it still leaves us with um, with even more places to go and even more to become. There's a sense in which each of us and our communities and our nations and our world continues to embody the five elements. The water of our dreams and of our flowing and of our interactions that are never completely under control but there's something about that spontaneity and that saturation that comes from the watery parts of ourselves that is essential to our living. And there is also something about the earth, that substance, that groundedness, that accountability that says you, you cannot lead people uh, to walk on air or walk on water. That is not what material bodies were designed to do. Certainly, there will be those who insist that there are miraculous exceptions and so forth. I, I think those exceptions are sufficiently rare that 
that's not where the greater part of our truth lies. There's something about respecting our limitations that has this magical way of giving us wings to reach beyond them. But until you accept and acknowledge the limitations, it may be difficult to even recognize that there is something beyond them. Uh, many people don't look beyond their limitations and they never realize that they are a microcosm within a macrocosm. There are an individual within a community and that the relationship between the individual and the community, like the relationship between the five elements, is what is essential, is what makes it possible to have a holistic integration, to have wholeness and holiness, that it is by including the things we fear and the things we cherish, the things for which we hope and the things we seek to avoid. It is by including all the diverse voices of our community, all the diverse voices of our elements, all the diverse voices even within ourselves, that uh, one of the perplexities of humans is that we almost we frequently uh, want more than one thing at the same time. And I don't know that that's essentially wrong as long as we can get back to understanding how these diverse things can in fact be interwoven and serve in a complementary symbiotic kind of harmony. Uh, like all the instruments in the orchestra, learning to play in key, in, in tuning with each other. You know, that the creation of the orchestra does not mean the annihilation of violins or trumpets or any other individual instrument. Uh, 